Thank you, everybody, for being a part of that installation service and for those of you online for your support as well. I've had the privilege of being prayed for, so now allow me to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that it is profitable for teaching, correcting, for growing, for learning in righteousness. And God, we pray that as we open up your word one more time, that you would speak to us the way you want to speak to every one of us as individuals this morning. That my words would fall down, that yours would be lifted up, and we would have life transformation that brings you glory. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Before I came to Ellerslie, I was a pastor at a small rural church about 45 minutes west of the city. And small church and large church actually look pretty similar. We both sing on Sunday mornings. We both have sermons on Sunday morning. We both do communion about once a month. But this small rural church did one thing that was unique and that we don't do here at Ellerslie. We called it Sharon Prayer. So every week I would stand on the platform and in front of 50 or 60 people, I would ask for them to share and have their prayer requests known and prayed for. And usually there was the same kind of idea week in, week out. God, please pray that um, we would have the ability and the wisdom and courage to go share the gospel with our friends. Pray that my husband would find a job. Pray that I would receive healing. And these were pretty normal. <clears throat> but one Sunday, one of our seniors stood up and she was shaking a little bit. We had chairs at my previous environment and she was gripping onto that chair like it was going to run away. And she talked for a little bit. And she said, I recently saw my doctor and he said to me that there was a lump on my breast and that we would need to go in and see a specialist. And so last week, my husband and I went and saw a specialist and he confirmed that it was very likely cancerous and that next week we would do further uh, tests to see exactly what the next steps would be. And she said in a voice that was quivering, will you pray for me? Will you pray for my husband? And will you pray that God would take that lump away? And so, like I did nearly every single week, we would pray. We prayed that we would um, be able to share the gospel with our neighbors. We prayed for people who needed jobs. We prayed for healing. And then we prayed for this dear Saint Vicky. We prayed that God would comfort her and her husband, Doug. We prayed that the doctor would have wisdom. And we prayed as a church family that God would completely remove that lump. And we prayed because we believe that we worship a divine physician who is able to heal us whenever he wants, however he chooses. The next week, Vicki showed up and she was vibrating with excitement. And she came in and during Sharon prayer, she said, for those of you who weren't here last week, we prayed that the lump on my breast would be um, marvelously removed. And it has been. And my doctor was flabbergasted and I said to him, well, it's because we prayed as a church that I was healed. As, and when we think about courageous community, we think about the different things that we do together. We teach one another, we admonish one another, we love one another, we forgive one another. And today we're talking about, will we pray and confess our sins with one another? If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them up to James chapter five. If you don't have a Bible, but you have a smartphone, you can download the app. The book of James is a little bit tricky to find. It's near the end of the Bible. It's right in between Hebrews and Revelation. The large numbers are the small num uh, the large numbers are the chapter numbers, the small numbers are the verse numbers. As you open up to the book of James, allow me to share some background. James is the half-brother of Jesus, which means he had a front row seat to all the miracles, all the teachings, all the wisdom of his brother. And how many of you have heard that line, maybe you've uttered it as parents, ugh, why can't you be more like your brother? Imagine Mary and Joseph saying this to James. And teenage James goes, he's literally God. He doesn't sin. He doesn't do anything wrong. You can't compare me to that. I can't imagine that would have been easy. Was James better at Jesus than anything? But at whatever their childhood was like, James was all in as an adult. He fully believes his brother is God. And James writes to us an incredible book full of wisdom for followers of Jesus. In his book, are 12 wisdom teachings, leaning heavily on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as well as the book of Proverbs. And we're going to look at the last of those 12 teachings. And this morning, if you enjoy taking notes, the first part of our passage today is asking for prayer. This is verses 13 to 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, 
The Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. These are pretty powerful words. We're going to start in verse 14. And nearly all of our English translations, whatever translation you enjoy reading the Bible in, we read the word sick. And we're immediately going to think of illness. We think of our friends who have cancer. We think of people with COVID. We think of a hundred different possible illnesses. And while sick probably is the best translation and found in every translation I looked at, it doesn't quite grasp the entire scope and breadth of what is the word really means. The word means not only to be weak in body, but also to be weak in mind and in spirit. Do we ask for prayer when we're sick? Absolutely we should. But it also means we pray when life seems overwhelming, when we feel like we're going to drown at work, when we don't have the spiritual strength to pray for ourselves, we go and we ask for prayer from others. The second idea that some of you might be unfamiliar with or not quite certain what it means is this idea of elders. Other churches might have elders or overseers or deacons. The idea here is spiritual leaders in the church who we can go to. So there's the pastors, there's staff, there's board members, there's ministry leaders, there's small group leaders, people who can come and pray for you. When we skip down to verse 16, you'll notice that James broadens that anymore. And he says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Being a part of courageous community means coming together and asking for prayer. And there's a few different ways this can look. One of my pastor friends, he'll send out a, an email a few times a year, three, four times a year, and sometimes he forgets to BCC everybody, and you realize just how long that list is. And in this email, he'll say, hi, everyone, here's my prayer request, and he'll lay it out. While I'm friends with this individual, this email isn't written to me directly, it's written to a number of people. And so I'll stop and I'll pray for a moment for him and then carry on with my day. There's also times where after the service, somebody will come up to me and say, Dave, can you pray for me? And this becomes a little bit more intimate, a little bit more interactional. We might come to the front of the auditorium. We might go to a prayer room, maybe slide into my office, and I'll get to know them a little bit. What's happening? What's going on? What are we praying for? Is it for healing? Is it for work? Is it, is it for something else entirely? And there's a powerful few moments spent together. But as we think about courageous community, there's also times where you gather together with the same group of people on a regular, ongoing basis. And whether it's a prayer group, it's a triad, it's a small group, it's part of the ministry team, you get to hear that same prayer request week in, week out. Dave, I've been without a job for a month now. Finances are incredibly tight. Can we as a small group please pray that God would show up in powerful ways? You hear stories about people whose marriages are breaking up. You hear stories about people whose kids aren't around them anymore. And there's this vulnerability in asking for prayer. Because if you've been a part of these small groups, if you've been a part of triads, if you've gone to a prayer meeting, you know that it kind of sounds like my opening story. And we might ask for prayers um, of things that are happening in our lives, and those are good. But then sometimes people take that moment of vulnerability and they say, look, here's what's really going on in my life. I'm going to peel back that curtain and show you what's happening. In one of my previous environments, I was meeting with a group of men at 6.30 on Tuesday mornings. We were going through the Bible study on Ephesians. We were praying together regularly. It was a really good group. And here we are, a group of men, early in the morning, and one of the guys at about quarter to seven just breaks down in tears. And he says, guys, my marriage is falling apart. And as good as Ephesians is, I'm sure we'll teach through it eventually. Suddenly it doesn't matter. And this group of men surrounds this one gentleman and says, how can we pray for you? How can we support you? What do you need from us right now? We confess our sins with one another and we pray for one another. My previous environment out at Alberta Beach, there was a group of us um, young adults who were gathering together and same idea. We would pray regularly together and then one day someone got ultra vulnerable and said, look, I am struggling with pornography and I don't know what to do. Courageous community can't simply be a social gathering. Courageous community means to have this radical sense of belonging to one another, where in this vulnerability we say, friends, here's what's going on. Here's what's happening in my life. This is why I need prayer. I can't handle it at work anymore. I feel like I'm overwhelmed with everything that's happening. There's so much going on at home. And with three kids and no extracurricular activities, I'm just drowning in being a parent. 
I don't know who to talk to about my mental illness. But it just feels like there's this depression that's creeping in on me and I don't know what to do with it. I'm struggling where scripture and culture collide. Can we talk? Can we pray for strength? Asking for prayer isn't just about the vulnerability of the individual making a request. There's also the expectation of the prayer. With verses 15 and 16 in front of you, look at what James says. Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. My friends, look at what James says. Who needs faith? The one asking for prayer or the one who is praying? And if you're here this morning and you've been told the reason you weren't healed, the reason you didn't get a job, the reason you have a broken relationship with your child is because you don't have faith, I am so sorry that happened to you. If you're online and want to reach out, please do so to the host this morning. What James is saying is it's not the one asking for prayer who needs faith. They've already presented their faith by coming and asking for prayer. What James is saying to you who are the spiritual leaders, to you who are in the small group, to you who are meeting together regularly, do you have faith that God will show up? There's this great story in Mark chapter 9 about a man who's asking Jesus to heal his son. And this man brings his afflicted child to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us out. Jesus responds in, uh, in 9 verse 23, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believe. Immediately the father of the child cries out, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus heals the little boy. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that God heals today? Do you believe that God restores bodies? Do you believe that God restores relationships? Do you believe that God can take away the mental illness and the depression and the overwhelming feelings of anxiety or guilt or pain or worry? Do you believe Jesus heals today? Do you see the definitive language in verses 15 and 16? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. You will be healed. This is really definitive language. And this is the God we worship. The God who restores not only our bodies, but our souls and our minds as well. Do you believe it's true? And maybe you're a little bit like me. A little bit like the dad in Mark chapter 9. I believe. God, help my unbelief. But it still leaves us with a question. What does this mean? I read five commentaries this past week. Every single one of them said something different, and I thought, well, that's not helpful at all. So let me humbly propose what I think this verse means. First of all, I believe God miraculously heals. I believe God miraculously healed Vicky back in Alberta Beach, and I'm not going to share the story today, but I have my own miraculous story of healing that I believe came only from God. So then what does it mean if we don't think he heals 100% of the time, every time? In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he prayed that that pain and that physical torture that he knew was coming tomorrow, that he would be healed and delivered from it. God says, no. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul tells a story of having a thorn in his flesh and praying that God would remove it, and God says, no. And at the end of this passage, and we'll look more at it in a few minutes, in James chapter five, we read how Elijah prayed for rain to come, and God answered the prayer, which is interesting, because the chapter before, James raises a child from the dead Pardon me, Elijah raises a child from the dead and James chooses not to use that story. But you know what does happen? Right after Jesus prays, we read this in Luke 22, verse 43. And ain't, pardon me, I'm ahead of myself. Gerald, can you please flip back? I don't think my clicker's allowing me to do so. 
an angel from heaven appeared to him, to Jesus, and strengthened him. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, right after the Apostle Paul makes his prayer, it says, my grace is sufficient for you, says God, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And remember what we learned just a moment ago, this idea, this word for sick is more than just a physical sickness. It's about being weak mentally. It's about being weak emotionally. It's about being weak spiritually. And James says, the prayer will raise him up. How can we, as a family of God, not be incredibly encouraged when a group of people, whether pastors, elders, small group leaders, your small group, your triad surrounds you and says, we want to pray for you. Will you be physically healed? That's up to God. But is there an emotional, a spiritual recognition? I feel so much better. Where Jesus was healed and lifted up, where the Apostle Paul was as well, and us too. Not only do we ask for prayer, but verse 16 reminds us that we also have confession and prayer. Taking another look at verse 16, we read, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I find this a really encouraging verse. I find 75% of this a really encouraging verse. Pray for one another, sounds great. We're gonna be healed, Excellent. Confess your sins to one another? That's tough. We have five values as a church. One of these five values is courageous community. It's where we got this sermon title. In unpacking exactly what it means, our church leadership said, we embrace the radical belonging to one another nature of the body of Christ. But for courageous community to take place, for us to truly belong to one another means wrestling through difficult topics in uncomfortable situations, including confession. I don't believe there's a demon hiding under every rock. I do not believe that every sickness comes from sin. I have a three-year-old daughter, and when she's sick, she sneezes right in my face, and I'm pretty sure that's how I got sick too. But I do believe that some of our sin comes, pardon me, some of our sickness comes from sin. How many of us can't sleep after we get in a fight with our spouse? How many of of us find ourselves anxious because we know tomorrow morning somebody from work is going to send us that nasty email and we don't even want to open it up? How many of us know that we yelled at our friend or a coworker and tomorrow we got to see them and it's not going to be comfortable and we get a knot in our stomach that won't go away? The illness isn't just in our head. It's because of the fear, because of the anxiety, because of the hurt we cause that our body starts to break down. But then how often after we make things right are we able to carry on again? So how do we confess well? Four ideas for you this morning. We start by confessing our sin to God. Here's the good news. God already knows our sins, already knows our mistakes, already knows where we've fallen short. And he will always forgive us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. If we claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have missed the mark. Let's just own it. Second idea, keep the confession short. Proverbs 10, verse 19 says, where words are many, sin is not absent. And so if you're at work, you don't need to schedule a half hour meeting to talk it through with somebody. You don't need to invite your friend at school out for coffee. You can just walk up to them and say, I'm sorry for breaking your phone. I should not have done that. I want to make it right. Will you forgive me? Nobody says it's easy, but it's good, and it can be short. The third thing, use personal pronouns. Living in courageous community means we need to take responsibility for our own actions. I remember going to see a counselor a number of years ago, and the counselor said to me, Dave, even if you're only responsible for 10 or 20% of what's taking place, which I doubt, you still need to own your 10 or 20%. What did you do wrong? How can you make that right? And I don't know too many relationships in which a confession is going to sound good if you say, I'm sorry for yelling at you, but you were acting like such an idiot. Probably not going to land. But if we own our mistakes, it makes a world of a difference. 
I'm sorry for yelling at you. I lost my temper. I said some terrible things and I need to apologize. Will you please forgive me? Final comment. Don't attach excuses. We aren't here to justify our actions. When we think about what's happening right now in COVID, how many of us parents are overwhelmed because our kids can't either go to school or can't have extracurricular activities and there's just so much going on. How many of us at work are putting in extra hours, more days, just to do the extra work that needs to get done? How many of us are frustrated with the government and going, which regulation are we supposed to cover today? And what happens if we don't? Is my business going to get shut down? Is my boss going to yell at me? Am I going to get suspended? All of us are under stress to say, I shouldn't have done that. But I'm really stressed at work, and I just got in a fight with my spouse, and you know, I took it out on you. I'm really sorry, but I shouldn't have done it bringing the focus back on me rather than on what needs to be said. There's always more to say, but I hope a quick summary of confession helps us to improve our relationship. Confess our sins to God, keep the confession short, use personal pronouns, and don't attach excuses. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, and you will be healed. What an incredible promise. I love telling stories. I love to share what's going on in my lives and stories that I read about. But sometimes it's important to recognize there's so much going on besides that pastor's life. This whole sermon series is entitled Courageous Community and we wanted to tell you a couple stories of what's going on in other people's lives. There's a group of men, there's four of them that meet together every Monday afternoon at about 4.30 and they pray together and encourage one another. This video is about four minutes long, but for half an hour, they were recorded telling answered prayer after answered prayer after answered prayer. I hope you're encouraged. On Mondays, I I leave our prayer time feeling lightened, I suppose, that uh, I've been able to meet with three other people and express my concerns to God and have other people praying on my behalf. But one time that comes to mind really is a a period of several months when my son Jack in in about a six month period had had a very serious, you know, life-threatening condition. And today, praise the Lord, he is healthy and moving on with his life. But during that time when he was sick and he was in treatment, It was wonderful having some people to share the concern. And we continue to pray for uh, family members who don't yet know the Lord. Uh, We continue to pray for, you know, colleagues that don't know the Lord that we can invite to Alpha and to church. And uh, so many of the prayers are are out there and we know that God is working. Um, And as Nestor said, they're not always answered immediately or in the way that we'd like them to be answered or in the timing maybe that we want. But we trust God that he's answering our prayers in his time and in in his way. We have spent a lot of time praying for each other's children, um, whether they're married, whether they're in university, whether they're just out on their own. And uh, uh, as a parent, uh, I'm just so grateful I've had uh, three other gentlemen that I could uh, share my concerns and my struggles with. It's a joy for us when we collectively, okay, pray for specific items that not necessarily affect us directly, but affects our body as as a church. And we are, well, rejoice when things turn out uh, the way the way that God wants and in, in a positive way. You know, these gentlemen uh, join me in prayer week after week, um, and in many cases, day after day. I'm spellbound when I look back on the past year and a half and see how prayer has been answered. From from the very first time that we uh, started to pray, I, uh, I made notes in a little notebook and turned to a fresh page every time we got together on Monday afternoon. And uh, I, I, like when Nestor uses the word rejoice, when I flip back pages to uh, a year and a half, year and a half ago, and uh, I see how prayer has been answered, it's uh, I rejoice over that. It's it's absolutely amazing. Uh, a year and a half ago, I didn't know where my youngest daughter lived, but we prayed about it, and uh, we're in communication today. And God had His hand in that.
My life has been enriched by being able to share what's going on in my life with uh, three other brothers and get to know them better, get to know their concerns, get to know their praise items uh, at the same time. I find comfort that even though we haven't been able to meet personally, but during COVID, I look forward to that day in which the four of us can meet and share part of our stories, part of our life. And it's not that unusual to have my phone vibrate and there's a, there's a text coming in with a prayer request or some sort of praise item. And it's just great knowing that, you know, we're connected with each, to each other in that way. And yeah, and it's been a great source of encouragement uh, to me as well. Uh, as I come up to difficult times throughout the week uh, that I know that I have three other brothers praying for me, even when we're not together, I know that we pray for each other throughout the week. And um, yeah, it's just been a, a huge source of encouragement and comfort knowing that I'm being covered in prayer and my family's being covered in prayer. My marriage is being covered in prayer. And uh, yeah, um, it just praise be to God that uh, you know we have a community like this to share our concerns with and go to God with. I think Sunday mornings are incredibly important. Our team, a number of volunteers, put a lot of work into making sure Sundays happen. But there's way more time than just this one hour on Sunday morning. And if you're sitting here going, Dave, I want to be a part of a small group like that. Randy was the gentleman sitting down with the tanned pants and the beard, and he said at one point, I'm spellbound when I look at my notebook and see all the answers to prayer. And if you say, give me some of that, there's connecting cards in the pew rack in front of you. If you're online, uh, the online host can put in a connecting card, or you can go to www.erbc.ca slash connect. We ask for prayer. We practice confession and prayer. And James wraps it up with an example of prayer. This is verses 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Imagine you're reading this for the very first time, and you, and you read, Elijah was a man just like us. And you go, oh, good, a story. Let's hear what this is all about. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And you think, oh, yeah, I'm going camping with a couple buddies this weekend. I'm going to pray, God, that it doesn't rain, and hopefully we have a great hike together. For three and a half years, it did not rain on the earth. He might go, uh, excuse me, three and a half years. I was hoping for a nice hike, just like us. Kind of sounds like this Elijah guy has a direct line to God. The story of Elijah can be found in 1 Kings, um, uh, 1 Kings and in 2 Kings. And if you're not reading anywhere in your Bible right now, these stories are incredible. Miracle after miracle of what God is doing through Elijah. Anyway, right after Elijah prays and God miraculously answers with this deluge of rain, he runs away from the king's wife, scared that she might kill him. I mentioned earlier that Elijah, by God's power, raised a child from the dead. He called fire down from heaven. He was fed by birds. He performed miracles for widows, and he still had bouts of self-pity. Elijah gets scared like we do. He gets depressed like we do. He has uncertainty like we do. What we don't read in James is what happened behind the scenes that led to this moment. The king of Israel at the time was a terrible man. We read in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And while his sins were plenty, the worst of all of them was he was worshiping other gods. Just a couple verses later, we read that uh, Elijah came up to him. And says to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Now listen to this, because I think it pulls the whole message together. It wasn't until the people of Israel removed the priests of Baal, the, the sin that was awful in God's sight, that the healing, there was healing brought to the land. It wasn't until the people of Israel removed the priests of Baal, bringing healing to the land, that the rain came down. And do you see what happens when a group of people start praying together? When an entire nation says, we want to do what is right, God brings healing. 
When a group of four men gather together on Monday afternoons and pray together, God brings healing to their families. When individuals come together asking for prayer, God brings healing, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, or otherwise. And when a church gathers together and a church confesses their sins and prays to one, for, for one another, there is healing that happens within the church. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And this is incredible news. And here's what makes Christianity even better. If the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective and can accomplish this type of healing, imagine what would happen if somebody was perfectly righteous. Somebody who had no sin whatsoever began to pray. We have such a man. Jesus Christ, the half-brother of James, is sitting at the right hand of God and is interceding on our behalf. We read about it, I believe it's Romans 8, 34. And while we don't know what type of healing awaits us on earth, we know the healing on the other side of glory is perfect. Our bodies fully restored. Mental health, perfect. Relationships, perfect. Emotional state, perfect. Relationship with God, perfect. Because a perfectly righteous man prays for us. We don't have a closing song tonight, so allow me to pray for us a little bit longer than I normally would at the end of a message. Heavenly Father, if we're like the dad at, in Mark chapter 9 who says, God, can you do this? God, please fill us with belief and overcome our unbelief. God, for those of us who are here this morning, who are experiencing physical ailments, God, we pray for physical healing. We pray that you would restore their body, whatever it is that might be affecting them. God, for those of us in this room who are having relational challenges, whether it's with a spouse, with a family member, with a good friend, with somebody at work, God, we pray that you would make it right. And if we have sinned, that we would have the spiritual courage to go and confess our sins to one another to apologize to our workmate, to apologize to our neighbor, to go and make things right with a family member and that you would heal our relationships. God, for those of us who are struggling with mental illness and mental challenges, that you would heal our minds, that there would be comfort, that there would be love, that there would be encouragement, that there would be support. God, for those of us who have a difficult time praying and opening the scripture each day to pray. Thank you for bringing us here in person and watching online. And God, we, may we find ourselves spiritually healed, restored in our body, desiring to read your word and wanting to spend more time praying. God, may we be a church where we see miracles happen, where we confess our sins, where we pray for one another and where courageous community takes place. God, we pray, as Colton led us in the last song in the morning set, come Holy Spirit, change our minds, transform our hearts so that we might be more like you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.